Hello, Dr. Hansen. My name is Mike Partika, and I'm a longtime fan. I was first introduced to your work through your book, Mexifornia, which was lent to me to read by a friend of mine. And I was uh, drawn to your articles on National Review after that, until they went full paywall. And at that point, I decided to, you know, drop my reading of them. But I have since found you on uh, various YouTube videos, and also just recently found out about your site, victorhansen.com, which I will put a link to in the video description so that my viewers can get introduced to your work as well. I have since found your podcasts page on victordehansen.com, the Blade of Perseus uh, site, and uh, the Victor Davis Hansen show, which uh, features you uh, taking questions from Jack Fowler and Sammy Wink. And I have listened to the entirety of your podcast content on that channel. So after listening to, I want to say, probably over 100 hours of your content, I want to say that I've gotten pretty well immersed in your thoughts. And I, I have to say, though, that there are four points on which I want to uh, address you so that you have an opportunity to kind of maybe correct a few flaws in uh, your thinking, the first of which has to do with the 2020 election. So point number one deals with a statistic that you have trotted out on a few occasions that I'm really not sure is accurate. Um, there is the allegation that in 2016, the signature rate of rejection of ballots, of, of absentee ballots coming in, was uh, 5%, and that in 2020, the same signature rate of rejection uh, was like 0.4% or something like that, something comparable to those kinds of numbers. Now, you've repeated this statistic a few times, and so I thought to myself, you know, that is, that is a statistic that sounds too good to be true. Um, it's something that, you know, I would for it to be true, because that would seem to be evidence of kind of voter fraud in the election. But at the same time, let me go fact check that. So I did. And in the fact check article that I found, which I have not tried to reprint or link to here, because what I would really appreciate you do is go find a fact check source to your liking and see if this is an accurate or inaccurate statistic that you've been repeating. But what it's telling me is that the rate of rejection, that is the 5%, is not the signature rate of rejection. It's actually the rate of rejection for all absentee ballots overall for whatever reason. And the 0.4% in 2020 is, in fact, just the signature rate of rejection. So you're taking a, a larger representative number here and trying to compare it against the smaller subgroup of that number. And uh, this is something that has been uh, repeated by other sites as well. So what, what I have been told by the fact-checking websites is that the 5% in 2016 of all rejections is pretty much equivalent to, the fi to, to a 5% reject, uh, uh, rejection rate for all rejections in 2020 as well. And likewise, the signature rejection rate in 2020 is l roughly the same as the signature rejection rate in 20 uh in well in 2016 and in 20 uh, 2020 so basically the numbers are the same once you start comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges uh so what i'd really love for you to do is investigate that yourself before you repeat that any further times just to make sure that you're on the right track because you might find a fact checking source and it might tell you no no we actually did get the numbers right the first time it was five percent and now it's 0 0.4 percent in which case that's perfectly fine by me i just want you to, have to make sure you have taken the effort to verify that so that's point number one Point number two is a constitutional quibble. On a couple of recent occasions, you've said that if Republicans manage to take the Senate as well as the House, and if they manage to take the Senate by 10 seats so that they have a 60-seat majority, then they will not only be able to impeach President Biden in 2023, they will also be able to remove him because they have that 60-seat majority. Well, this is technically not correct. The Constitution states that it requires a two-thirds majority of the Senate, which in our, in our present configuration would be 67 votes, to remove an impeached official, whether it's the president or anybody else. 
Uh, so you would need at least 67 votes, not 60. The 60 vote rule applies only to the filibuster. This is a this is a, um, a Senate rule, the filibuster rule, that requires it. And this used to be two thirds, but it is now uh, 60. Uh, but but that's to close debate and then move toward passing a law. So just like with this Voting Rights Act that came up recently, yeah, you know, they they couldn't uh, end the filibuster on it and so or well actually I think they did end the filibuster on it but they didn't uh, they didn't have the votes to pass it something like that uh, but in the Constitution specifically it states that two-thirds of the senators are required to to remove an impeached official and it would take a constitutional amendment to change that the the, the 60 vote change that applied to the filibuster does not apply to the 67 vote requirement for conviction so uh, just wanted to throw that out for you and, and make sure you, you got straightened out on that one. Um, point number three, I don't know where you get this idea that there is a tradition of 50 states in the Union. You, you have referred to a couple of times of basically taking to task the Democrats' attempt to make D.C. a state and Puerto Rico a state. Um, and so that they could add senators and, and presumably they would be Democratic senators. You know, well, definitely in the case of D.C., since that, that has been a solidly Democratic bloc uh, ever since its inception. But um, there's no real tradition of, of having 50 states. It's just that we haven't admitted any states. Now, when I was a child of the 70s growing up, I always assumed that Puerto Rico was working on it that, you know, maybe there was some sort of you know, governmental cleanup or or establishing their Republican form of government that needed to take place before they could be admitted to the union. But I always thought that was the goal. You know, we have 50 states now, but the but the objective, if America is really the best country in the world, to is to absorb the entire planet one territory at a time you know we'll do puerto rico we'll do guam we'll do american samoa we'll do the u.s virgin islands you know maybe we'll start looking at our northern and southern neighbors you know maybe mexico will decide to become a state maybe some of the south american countries will decide to become states maybe we'll have some canadian provinces that decide to become states maybe we'll go across the pond to uh to europe oh, well across the pond is probably something referring to the english channel but um uh, or is it a reference to the Atlantic Ocean? But uh, if we go to Britain, you know, maybe we can uh, say, hey, Northern Ireland, you want to be one of the United States? In fact, I think there was actually a time when Poland was considering uh, becoming part of the United States. So uh, that's what a, a former Polish citizen told me. Uh, but it was always the idea that America was this great country and, you know, eventually everybody would want to join us. So I don't know where you get this idea of a 70-state tradition. And I, I really have to ask, considering that there were there was about 40 years or maybe 48 years or so, I think it was, I think 1912 was when the, uh, the 48th state of the union was uh, inducted in. And then Alaska and Hawaii, which were our 49th and 50th states respectively, were both uh, grafted in in 1959. Well, between that, you know, in that 45-year period, was, did people actually argue, you know, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't bring in Alaska and Hawaii. We've got this tradition of 48 states. I don't think so. I don't really remember that kind of resistance coming up, but maybe I'm wrong. That's not necessarily a portion of history that I'm uh, really clear on. Our, our history class kind of basically stopped at Brown versus Board of Education and said everything magically got better from then on and now it's time for semester review. So we never really got to Alaska and Hawaii's 1959 uh, indoctrin or in induction into the Union. That would have been some interesting stuff to hold, but, you know, we, we spent, like, probably way too much time on Reconstruction. So, um, <laughs> well, the irony being is that the South didn't spend enough time on Reconstruction. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so, so, basically, I just don't know where you get this idea of a 70-year tradition of having 50 states. I think it's just more of an inertia type thing. We've, we've had 50 states so long that we just, you know, we've never seen... Uh, much of a priority to do it but i think back when it was the the induction of alaska and hawaii were much fresher there was more of an idea of okay where's the next state going to come in we've got 50 states where's 51 where's 52 
you know, we, we should be seeing more by now. So anyway, I would just encourage you not to think of it in terms of a, of a 70 year tradition of 50 states, because I don't think that tradition really exists. And even if it did, it's like, that's not, that's really immaterial. If a state wants to come in, you know, let's have the state come in by whatever criteria that we have allowed states in in the past. Now, the fourth and final thing that I'd like to really take you to task for is, for God's sakes, please say people's names correctly. I, I know sometimes you're joking. Uh, I know that when you say Don Lemon, I'm, I'm guessing that's a joke because I have heard you say Don Lemon on occasion. But uh, many occasions you'd say Don Lemon, and, and I wouldn't know whether you were uh, actually mispronouncing his name or if you were just jokingly mispronouncing his name. I think, I think now I lean more towards the side of, of joking. But there are some names where I think you just honestly don't know how to say them. Uh, the most obvious example being Jussie Smollett. Uh, it is actually Jussie Smollett. It is not Juicy Smollett. That is a Dave Chappelle joke. <laughs> it's a, to, 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 to pronounce his name that way is a Dave Chappelle skit joke. Um, it is not uh, Juicy Smollett. Uh, it's not Jussie Smollett. And, and I have to admit, I was ignorant of how to properly say his name myself for a while now. And the way that I did this, and now I do this for all names that I have any kind of question about, is I just go to YouTube or I go to the internet and I say, how do you say, and then type in the person's name. And once you do that, you will get some videos and you know most of the videos will be correct. You'll occasionally see an incorrect video, but you will get a video saying, here's how you say this person's name. And that's how I found out it was Jesse Smollett. Um, you should also do the same for Kamala Harris. It's not Kamala Harris. This is something that a lot of people get wrong, and it's kind of understandable because there are people who spell their name the same way, K-A-M-A-L-A, -A -A, and pronounce their names Kamala. But Kamala Harris is not one of those people. Um, now, Ka Kamala Khan, on the other hand, who is the Ms. Marvel character who will soon be appearing in, uh, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, she actually does pronounce her name Kamala. But our Vice President, Kamala Harris, does not pronounce her name that way. And so please start getting that right. And please, 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 please start getting Beyonce's name right. It's Beyonce. It is not Beyonce. I mean, surely you have heard her name pronounced correctly. It's, it's just, why? Why? You know, this... This is an easy one. It's Beyonce. There's a reason there's a little accent on the end of her name. I'm pretty sure there's an accent on the end of her name. I should actually look that up. I can't believe I didn't do that before I did that. So let's see. Beyonce. Beyonce Knowles. And that is her actual name. That's not a stage name or anything. That's what she's actually named. Beyonce. Here we are. Beyonce Giselle Knowles Carter. Yes, Beyonce. She's got that accent on the end of her name for a reason. So please, use it. It's Beyonce. It's not Beyonce. That, I, I swear, there's nothing that's going to make you seem like out-of-touch out of old white man more than that. <laughs> I mean, and and that's, that's the last thing that commentators who, you know, well, actually are old white men, such as myself, I just turned 50 recently, um, we can't really afford to have that. So <laughs> please, please do start saying her name properly. Beyonce, not Beyonce. Wow. Okay, so, Dr. Hansen, thank you very much for all of your time and listening to this video. I hope you are getting to see it. I would love to be able to discuss this kind of stuff with you in person, but, you know, things are what they are, and COVID, and uh, the uh, just, just whatever your particular schedule is, and mostly just the fact that you have way better things to do than ever meet with me uh is probably going to have a uh, negative impact on that so um, hopefully you will get to see this video i hope maybe one of my followers will communicate this video to you so that you can uh, get up to speed on these four points that i have addressed and uh anyway i would recommend if you are one of my followers watching this video and uh, you have not experienced dr hansen yourself please do Go to his site, it's victorhansen.com. I will put a link in the video description to it. Go especially to his podcast section where you will see him opining on various current events issues. And there's also places where he's put some of his video interviews. 
and uh, and you will be able to get exposed to his mindset and, and his uh, knowledge of history and the classics and uh, other great stuff there. So thank you all for watching. I'm Mike Partika, and I will talk to you later.